Pink and Duvall has a line like this about whatever ambition is the pact you make with yourself to be unhappy until you succeed or something along those lines. And that's basically what it is, right? Like, even if it's not a conscious, like, thought that you have, the implicit belief is like, once I reach whatever, like, once I reach the next promotion, once I make this much money, I reach this benchmark in my bank account or have this number of subscribers or followers or what have you, then, like, then I then I'll then I can be happy, right? Or like that's the target, and I can't be happy until I meet that goal. Rob, it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. So grateful because you came on episode forty-seven, and now yeah. we're back in February of twenty twenty when this is published, or twenty twenty-four. Excuse me, twenty twenty was when we first recorded, and I'm curious. Why is In N Out your favorite restaurant? Yeah, well, hey, Danny, yeah, it's it's, it's great to be back. Um, yeah, In N Out is my favorite restaurant because it was really the only restaurant I went to when I was a kid growing up in foster homes in Los Angeles. So my social worker, who was responsible for my case, she would come check in on me every few weeks. Um, and typically, she'd take me to In and Out, uh, and you know, it's funny. I, I used to think that was her favorite place to eat because that's the only time I ever went out anywhere to eat, and that's the only place she ever took me. Uh, but you know, in hindsight, it was probably because she had a huge caseload, and In and Out was like, you know, among the choices for fast food, it was the best one, and um, so it just became like that. That eating establishment became intertwined with this sort of attachment I had to Jerry, my social worker, because she was the only reliable adult figure, the only one that I saw on a regular basis. Um, you know, and it was, yeah, a strange, a strange feeling that my attachment to her, my, my positive regard for her became intertwined with this restaurant. And so now, you know, it's, it's funny, there's, there's psychology research indicating that the sense of smell is the strongest um, it's the sense that is the most um, closely intertwined with memory. And so when you see things from your childhood or you hear a song from your childhood, those might activate things. But when you smell something, that seems to have the strongest effect in bringing you back to that period of your life. Um, and so now every single time I step into an in and out and I smell the whatever the fries and the food, the onions, whatever. Um, yeah, it does bring me back. Uh, and it's kind of this bittersweet feeling because, of course, living, living in foster care isn't a great experience, but it does sort of bring me back to those rare moments of joy um, when I was with my social worker. And she'd sort of check in on me and ask how things are going or how I'm feeling or, you know, ask if I wanted some more fries or, you know, it was just having an adult around that was um, looking after me. Yeah. And it's it's interesting, even when I ask the question and hear your response, it's like, there's there's a real heaviness in how you responded. And I could understand the heaviness from going through your book, Troubled, which is out either now or very soon for those listening. And it's a memoir of your life. And it's you've lived so many lives yeah. in such, I mean, what are you, 34, 35 years old? I'm 34, yeah. So you're 34 years old. You live so many lives. And the the darkness that it appears and it feels like even from hearing you speak and it appears after reading like it's it's remarkable to to witness and it's it's really special to to be in your presence because like i most people wouldn't hey. most people wouldn't right and by virtue of the statistics so yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that's that is a point that I wanted to to dwell on at some length in the book was that, you know, it's 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 I'm in a weird position because I lived a very sort of statistically anomalous life. Um, and so on the one hand, I did want to communicate the lessons I learned and the mindset that is required to sort of rise above those impoverished and chaotic circumstances but I also wanted to shed some light on what is the sort of typical outcome of someone in that environment, how you can't necessarily expect kids in general or every kid 
to be able to follow the same path that I followed. And so I do speak to some extent about you know, some of my friends that I grew up with, uh, the outcomes of my friends at high school, um, what are the statistical um, uh, data points for kids who are in foster care or who grew up very poor in the U.S.? Um, and so, yeah, it was um, it was a weird sort of like tightrope to walk that, you know, here's what you need to do uh, if you want to have any hope of improving your circumstances, while at the same time saying that, look, even if every single kid follows these, you know, my outcome is far from guaranteed. You can, it's definitely, um, you know, it will improve it, but as far as like how much you can't necessarily expect to have the same kind of trajectory I had. And so, yeah, I just think like both of those two things, keeping them in mind was a, was a challenge as I wrote the book. How much of that heaviness from the first 18 years have you not accepted or not let go of yet? Uh, you know, when I was writing the book, it was surprising to me how fresh some of the feelings were, you know, you know, I I figured, you know, I put a lot of this stuff behind me. I'm doing well in my life now. I have no reason to complain. It, It almost feels like childish to like go back and talk about, oh, you know, poor me. I had this poor upbringing, whatever. And, um, but you know, I, if I wanted the book to be honest and I wanted it to be raw and really sort of tell the story in the most authentic way, I had to go back and really communicate what I was feeling at that time, you know, at the time when I'm a seven year old foster kid with no uh, knowledge that, oh, in 20 some years, he's, you know, you're going to be a graduate of some fancy colleges, and you're going to be doing well, and you're going to have a big writing platform and on and on. It's just, you know, when you when you don't have that, what are you thinking at age seven, when your circumstances are so bleak, and you look around and other kids are also having difficulties in their lives. And so I, I wanted to communicate that story. Um, how much of the heaviness, I think now, you know, it's, it's fine. You know, it's, it's there on occasion, it flares up. I mean, it's funny, like I'm, I can feel it sometimes just the, you know, it's hard to separate nature and nurture how much of this is just sort of, you know, built in uh, from the start and how much of it is due to those early life experiences, both play some role for sure. But, you know, I will get um, angry <laughs> and I can get, you know, I, I the, the book, I communicate what a temper I had when I was a teenager and in my early 20s. And even now, I, you know, I'm, I'm at a hotel right now in Nashville. I won't say which one, but, you know, I, I got I arrived late at night um, yesterday. The hot water wasn't working in the sink or the shower. I call down to the front desk and, you know, on and on. Like, they, they keep telling me maintenance is coming. I finally go down there and ask to talk to the manager, who's some middle-aged guy, and he's giving me the runaround. And, you know, my my immediate impulse is to, like, just get into it with him. Uh, and I have to hold it back and, like, be an adult, be a, you know, be a sensible person. Um, but, you know, that same situation when I'm 19 years old, you know, who knows where that could have gone. Um, so with the benefit of age and maturity and maybe a little bit of wisdom, I'm able to sort of put it behind me and sort of, you know, be a, be a, be a mature adult. But, you know, those chaotic early life experiences, especially when you don't have adult figures sort of telling you how to behave or what's expected or how to just sort of be a civilized human being, um, you know, your, your methods of resolving conflicts can be, you know, not, not, um, not helpful. Um, so yeah, I don't know if this is answering the, the, the heaviness. It's it's still there, but I'm able to sort of contain it, at least in my behavior, if not necessarily uh, inside internally. Yeah. So how it sounds to me is you, it comes up sometimes and you just push it down and you're like, I don't need to feel that right now. I'm a civilized adult. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I don't feel it nearly as often as I did, you know, 15 years ago or something. Uh, it, it flares up usually like when I'm in it, like, okay, so like tired, hungry, jet lagged, like those kinds of vulnerable mental states or physical states, but day to day, you know, that's the other thing. Like, you know, I think a lot of people who've never really experienced extreme poverty or disorder in their life when there's very little friction, right? Like when you, oh, something like you, you, you need something, oh, you have money, pay for it. Or, oh, you need someone to fix something like, oh, you can get it done or you know, like you need an appointment, no issue, you know, front of the line because you have whatever special pass. 
But when you're poor and, you know, like every dollar counts and every minute counts and you don't have a lot of time or, or energy left over, then you're in a much more sort of stressful mental state. And any little thing that contributes additional stress can set you off, you know, set you over the edge. So, you know, I, I guess, yeah, that's that's another sort of helpful factor. It's not, you know, I don't want to I guess I don't want to credit myself too much or pat myself too much on the back. I don't have it under control. The other thing is, like, you know, I just have more money. <laughs> And like more time, more education, more access, like all the things that go along with sort of climbing that American class ladder of like, you know, things will work out, you know, you can, and you can sort of rest assured at a certain level of sort of class income education, like things will work out. But like when you're on that teetering edge of, of poverty or, or it's just sort of squalor, you know, like things aren't necessarily going to work out and you know that, and that can also contribute to sort of temperament and anger and so on when did you realize oh i'm in a completely different stratosphere of quote-unquote making it when did i realize <laughs> this is gonna sound i don't know if this is like the the best answer but the answer that immediately comes to mind the other day i was uh I, so i live with my girlfriend we were in our apartment and you know i was like packing to to travel here back you know and uh to nashville and I realized I had five sweaters and I grew up my entire life, one sweater, maybe two, maybe I had a backup sweater. And I was like, how the hell do I have five sweaters? Like, you know, that's like a, that's like a very, you know, I, a very like a luxurious, you know, I felt like a king, you know, seeing these five sweaters laid out on the bed. I was packed as I was packing up my luggage. I don't know if that means I made it, you know, you could get five sweaters from Goodwill or whatever, but you know, that, that was a feeling of like, wow, I have like more clothes than I need. And if I lost my sweater, if I lost my backup sweater, I still have three more sweaters. Um, the other thing is I was I was having this conversation actually the other day with a, with a mutual friend of ours, Chris Williamson. And um, it, I was telling him this story when I was 19 uh, of how I, I had just moved off uh, the military base I was stationed at when I was in the Air Force. And how, you know, I was 19. I didn't like I had never really like been in that situation where I you know, had to had to like figure out how to like negotiate with landlords and all this stuff. And I you know, I was like completely taken by surprise that when I rented this house with my friends, my military friends, you have to pay first month's rent, last month's rent and a security deposit. Uh, and so, by, you know, between those three uh, payments, plus, you know, all the other things I had to take care of, like suddenly I was like, basically like in the single digits in my bank account and I couldn't afford to buy a belt. And so I went like two weeks without a belt until my next paycheck. And now I have I actually have two belts now. But, you know, little things like that, I'll just remember like, oh, wow, like I have all the clothes I need. I have, you know, everything that um, and if I lost all my clothes, I could just easily replace the wardrobe. No issue. And that is just um, I still haven't fully uh, adjusted to that. Yeah. And and beyond the material, what what about the difference in the love that you feel? I know, for example, um, I'm reading the story about how you're seven years old and you're drowning in a pool and your caretaker, I believe her name is Miss Martinez, comes over to you and is like, what What are you doing in that pool? And, and is like on the phone while you're drowning, while she sees you're drowning. It's like, what in the world is going on there? And so that must have been an experience that you felt time and time again of not feeling yeah. loved. Yeah, that was a really tough i mean even just rewriting that it was hard man like she was just a very cold woman um and you know that's just you know that's just an example of like the the sterility and the problems with the foster care system is that they're just so overloaded i mean i just read this morning this is you know i don't remember the source but it basically the claim was that the la county foster care system is actually the most um overcrowded uh, in America and that they have like the fewest number of foster parents and the most number of children. And so getting placements in general is an extreme challenge. And so basically the system can't be like that picky if a foster parent is neglectful or cruel, you know, like short of like obvious, like severe abuse or something, they're going to, you know, they're not going to let a kid stay there. But beyond that, they will look the other way if a parent is less than optimal. And so, you know, I had a lot of those experiences. Most of it was straight up neglect like mrs martinez never hit me or never like burned me or never did anything like overly cruel 
But she would just like if I would hurt myself or get in a bad situation or something, she would just kind of like shrug her shoulders or shake her head and just, you know, kind of carry on with her business and let me deal with it as a little kid. Um, And so, yeah, the drowning episode where she kind of reluctantly pulled me out of the pool after letting me drown for, you know, what felt like an eternity was probably only a few minutes. Um, So the, the love I feel, I mean... I don't know, man. Like, I can, I, I can feel it, I guess. It's hard. It's hard. Like, I just, I've never been that much of a sort of touchy feely emotional person. And I don't know, actually. That's one of those things where, like, cause I know people who have had, like, pretty good upbringings and still, like, have issues with accepting love and feeling the love. And so it's, again, like, hard to separate nature and nurture. Um, I do feel it, actually, for my sister, who I write about in my book. She's one person where I, I don't really, um, it's not a struggle to feel, um, love for her or to care about her or to, you know, want her to do well in her life. I was just at her wedding, uh, a couple months ago and, um, you know, I, I delivered a wedding speech and, you know, I had just written this book. So I had all of these memories swirling around in the back of my mind and, Um, you know, so I gave this, this speech and it was like, you know, very heavy and, you know, very honest about how much I cared about her. And, you know, she was crying at the end of it. And, uh, you know, later the, the wedding DJ came up to me and he was like, you know, he was like, man, I was on the verge of tears for that. He was like, you know, I've, I've been doing, you know, weddings for, I mean, I've been working weddings for 10 years and that was probably the best wedding speech I ever heard. And, you know, I was like, you know, that was, you know, that to me, I guess, is like a, a sign that I guess I am capable of giving and, and receiving it. Um, but it's hard with other people um, to fully accept it or to trust it um, simply because, you know, I uh, living in different foster homes, changing them, you know, changing different homes every few months, being taken from my mother at such a young age, never knowing my dad, like all of those experiences you know, they do take a toll on a, on a young child's mind. And so developing attachments and bonds and trust and all those things, it becomes harder. Whereas, yeah, for my sister, I never really had any difficulties there. And she is like, I can just tell, you know, she's just like a very good person. Um, where, you know, for other, other people, it's, you know, I, I didn't grow up with them. I don't necessarily know for sure. And so there's always that sort of lingering feeling in the back of my mind, but you know, it's a, it's a hard thing, you know, like I've, I've read these accounts of other adoptees and people who lived in orphanages or foster care and so on. And they have a lot of difficulty with, um, you know, love and care and attachment and feelings. And, you know, one thing that I'm glad that I experienced a lot in my life was that, so in the foster homes, I was always around little kids. Of course, I was a little kid, a lot of other foster kids. I was comfortable with that environment, basically. Um, and then later, uh, and I discussed this in the book, my mom, after she and my adoptive father divorce, you know, she's my adoptive mom in this case, she, my adoptive father divorced, my mom gets into this relationship with this woman. And throughout my adolescence, um, Shelly, my surrogate mother, she was my mother's partner. Um, she had teenage daughters who had kids, you know, they were teen moms. And, so, you know, I just grew up in a home with a lot of babies and children and whatever. And so and I, I feel like overwhelming love and care for small kids. And so I don't really feel like apprehensive. Like, I know I'd probably be a pretty good dad. I'm comfortable around babies. Like I see other young guys sometimes and like they see a baby and they're just like, oh, I don't know how to hold a baby or, you know, they get awkward around kids or something. And I have none of that. So, you know, when I when I see a kid or a baby or something like you know, I do feel warmth and I do feel like that sort of protective instinct kicking in. So, you know, I think those feelings do, um, you know, they're, they're helpful. They're, they're nice to like, when I feel them, I, it's nice to know that I'm capable of that feeling. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. So your sister and babies are the two places where you're like fully trusting of mm-hmm. the love that you feel. What, what do you think it would take to feel that for other adults and be more comfortable feeling that for other adults? Uh, what it would take? 
I mean, in, in, realistically, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I just don't know. You know, I think that probably the reason is because I knew my sister from when we were very small children. And basically, the first thing she ever did for me was give me half of her toys. And, you know, it was just like extremely nice to me from the beginning. And so I just had that knowledge in, you know, that that's who she was. And with babies, of course, and little kids, like they're just, you know, they're innocent. Um, whereas for older people and adults and stuff, you know, there is that sort of, you know, you, you don't know for certain if you can fully trust. I, you know, I've, I've been in relationships. I can feel it. You know, I can, you know, I, I mean, I hope I'm a better boyfriend now than I, you know, was, you know, a decade plus ago. I used to not be a good, you know, not a good person to be in a relationship with. But, you know, what it would take. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I also think sometimes that, like, the, the feelings can be a little bit uh, overrated might be a strong word. But I think behavior counts more, right? Like, towards my adoptive mom, I care about her and I want her to do well in her life. And even if, you know, we've had our differences in the past and even if she wasn't always the best sort of caregiver when I was growing up, you know, in the end, what matters is like, I make sure she's taken care of and that she's doing well in her life and that, you know, whatever she needs, I can, I could help her with that. Um, whereas I know other people who, you know, they claim to care and love someone and maybe they do, but then in their actions, they behave abominably. Um, so, you know, I assign more, more value to behavior, I think. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because if, if you have, more difficulty feeling it, then of course you would attribute more, uh, more value to the behavior of it. But why not both? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Why not both? I mean, I think it's hard to, I think, so behavior is something that's like modifiable. You can actually, you know, do something you don't feel like doing in your actions. Um, I think it's much harder to change a feeling, right? Like, something as simple as like the gym, I may not want to go, I may like hate every second of it, but I can like physically force myself to go. I can't really force myself to love the gym, but I can force myself to work out. And I think for feelings or relationships, I mean, I kind of think about it in the same way, I think. It's interesting, because you could let go of your, um, your hatred of the thing. So like, if you if you hate going to the gym, and you still go, you could say, okay, but I'm here. So like, let me let go of the attachment to not liking it. And so, so there are things obviously in the way, understandably so, that are blocking your, um, your feeling of love in some sense. And it's like letting go of those things must be so difficult because it's ingrained in your being for so long. And there's so much resentment that's been built up. But if you let go of that, you could feel love and you can also... Um, have the action as well. Easier said than done. Yes. And <laughs> I'm not here saying that that's, that's a hundred percent possible in this moment, but I'd like yeah, to, I mean, think probably eventually, you know, like things change, people change and evolve and adapt and who knows, maybe, you know, it, you know, it, you know, it, it, it could happen later. I mean, I, I will say like, I'm, I'm probably more, I'm more trusting and like generally in a, a more, what, like, uh, just sort of a, I'm just like a nicer, softer person. Man, like I'm, I'm, you know, when I reread like the chapters of my book, when I, you know, like the middling chapters, when I'm a young adult and stuff, like I'm just like a much nicer, softer person. Um, you know, it's like, you know, I'm looking at old photos of myself from like my Air Force days or whatever. And I'm like, you know, I can just see like in my eyes that I was an angrier person. Uh, and now I'm like, you know, I'm pretty easygoing and, you know, it's, it's just different. Um, so yeah, who knows, maybe another five years, another 10 years, you know things all things will keep evolving in that direction. Yeah, I believe it. And it's it's really cool to see um the evolution and growth particularly for someone who has seemingly experienced so many of the different levels of consciousness. And so um when did you realize you were different than other kids? Huh. Um I mean, probably the earliest memories when I realized I was different than other kids was when I would watch TV. Uh, so, you know, like the first and second foster homes I lived in, when I started to sort of come online and sort of like take in details of my surroundings, you know, we'd watch TV and I would watch, I don't know, Family Matters or Roseanne or something. And I was like, yeah, this is like, you know, these kids aren't moving all the time. They're just like with their mom and dad and like they have a mom and dad and 
then I'd go to school and, you know, some of the kids, you know, I knew like most, most of the kids in my school weren't foster kids. Um, a lot of them did come from like single parent homes or whatever, but they weren't foster kids. And so I started to understand, um, yeah, there was something different about me. And then even later after I was adopted and I did have a mom and a dad and then later just a mom, um, you know, to say like, you know, I was adopted it, like I knew that it set me apart. There was something unusual about it or atypical and other kids, you know, most other kids aren't adopted. And so, yeah, it, um, you know, kind of from, from the beginning, maybe three or four years old and then all the way through. And then, you know, by the time you're an adult, no one asks about that anymore. It's not like a big part of your life anymore, but as a kid, it was sort of always hovering in the background of, you know, yeah, like, not having a dad or like, you know, not having my, my real parents around or, um, yeah, just having that, that experience. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it, it did feel, yeah, I, I could feel like a little bit different or a little bit weird compared to some of the other kids. And then what about different from the opposite end, meaning different, like exceptional? When did you realize you were exceptional? I mean, I don't really know if I ever felt that feeling. I mean, there were like kind of glimmers of it throughout my youth. Um, maybe the first time was when, I mean, so so I had a lot of difficulty with reading when I was a kid. There was a period where, you know, I was changing schools every couple of months uh, when I was in the foster homes in LA. And I was doing so poorly in school that the um, the foster care system, the social worker and the state of California thought I had a learning disability. The teacher thought I had a learning disability. And, you know, I was like tested way below average on my IQ score. And, you know, it was, it wasn't like, it was still within the, the, the range of average, but like below. And, um, so they concluded I didn't have a learning disability, but I wondered like, you know, in hindsight, it's like, you know, you're, you're making this kid change schools all the time. And he's doing badly in school. And the first thing you jump to is, oh, he has a learning disability. Like, that's just insane. Um, but then when I, I had to teach myself how to read. And then when I was adopted and had a bit of stability in my life. So I was eight years old by this point. Um, I got third place in the school spelling bee. Uh, and, you know, the fact that I even qualified to enter the spelling bee in the first place was a surprise to me. And. I think it was a surprise to my adoptive parents, too, because like they had the reports from my social worker like, oh, he's having some difficulty in school. He may need a little bit of extra help, whatever. And instead, like what happened was like I was actually doing really well. Um, and then, yeah, middle school, I was doing well, too. Uh, I always liked to read. That was the other thing. You know, my friends weren't really big readers. You know, it was funny. Uh, uh, someone at Cambridge asked me, you know, hey, did your have your friends from high school, have they read your book? And I'm like, they've read like little parts of it that they're in because they want to like read about themselves. But like, they're not going to read the book. They're just not they're not those guys. Like, they're not readers, man. And so but I was a reader and I liked to read. I'd go to the school library. The librarian knew me by a first name basis. Um, teachers would sometimes say, like, you're a smart kid, well, you know, especially later, like as the sort of drama in my family and all of this sort of disorder continued to evolve into my teenage years and I was doing poorly in school again. Um, teachers would spot that I was probably a pretty sharp kid and they would tell me so. And then they would just ask me like, what's going on? Like, why are you not focused or why aren't you doing your homework or, you know, why are you squandering your potential? And yeah, that's a point that I that I make in the throughout the book, which, which is that like a lot of people think that the reason why kids from unpromising situations don't do well is because the teachers aren't, you know, the the te you know the schools aren't receiving enough funding, the teachers aren't doing a good enough job, on and on. And maybe those things are true. Um, I'm sure you know schools could use more funding and all of those things, but teachers, you know, the people who choose the teaching profession tend to like kids and they tend to want kids to do well. And are usually pretty good at spotting kids who have some academic inclination. And my teachers did, you know, they were no exception to that. And, but my, my home life was such a mess and the place that I came from was so disruptive to my, you know, learning that I had very little interest in schooling or homework or doing well or 
any of those things. You know, was, college wasn't really a serious possibility to me. And so, you know, I, I guess all of those things, right? Like I knew I was a little different. I was doing the same things as them, but I was also, you know, reading and doing other things that they weren't doing. Um, to my knowledge, you know, I was the only one among my friends that my teachers would like personally pull aside and say like, you know, you, you could go to college if you just focused. And I was just like this angry kid who, you know, if an adult told me to do something like my, my initial impulse was always to do the opposite or tell them to F off or whatever. I don't know if we can swear on this podcast, but you know, just angry. Yeah. You can, if you'd like, <laughs> it's your <laughs> okay. world. All right. I, um, and so after that, you joined the Air Force? Yes. And what went into the decision to do that? Um, I mean, it was like half-baked, half-impulsive. Um, so I knew I wasn't going to college. I knew I didn't want to stay in Red Bluff, California, this kind of dusty working-class town. Um, you know, part of it was... I guess this is another thing that maybe separated me a little bit from my friends was that like, I would kind of attempt to glimpse into the future and see like, okay, if we keep doing this, what is our life going to look like in five years or 10 years? And I worked, uh, I had two different jobs in high school. So I was a dishwasher and a bus boy at a restaurant. And then later I was a bag boy at a grocery store. And the kinds of guys I worked with, like, you know, a lot of them were in there, like some of them, like their mid late twenties, you know, like they, graduated from the same high school that I was at. They were still working the same job that they had when they were 16 or 17. Um, and, you know, I remember at the time it was kind of cool. Like they'd buy beer for my friends and me or like hook us up with weed or whatever. But at the same time, it was like weird that, and I remember thinking like, it's, it is strange that like these, like, why would you buy beer for a bunch of kids? Or like, why would you, you know, at age 25, try to like hang out at a high school party? You know, there's like, do I want to be 25 years old hanging out with a bunch of 16 or 17 year olds? Not really, but that was like where things were going. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, I, again, like, so I had one teacher, uh, who took, you know, he, 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 he spotted something in me. He pulled me aside and he's like, Oh, you know, maybe, maybe the military would be a good thing for you to do. He showed me a picture. Of, he, he pulled up a picture of himself on his computer of him in his air force uniform and I thought, oh, that looks kind of cool. And then I lived with my friends, my friend and his dad and his brother, my senior year of high school. His dad was in the military. He also recommended it to me. And so, you know, and then I, I went to the recruiter. So one of my friends in high school was was kind of interested in joining. I went with him to the recruiter. And so, like, there, it was just kind of in the, in the air, sort of in the ambient environment of, you know, the military was a serious option. It was something basically at my high school, if you were you know, somewhat ambitious, you know, you didn't have good grades and, but you wanted to get out of there. That was like, you know, this was 2007 when I joined, I was 17 years old. And so, you know, this was like the, the military, we had two wars going on. There was like, you know, it was just more on people's radar, the military in general. So, you know, but then when I went, you know, I, I was like very unprepared when I took the test. I didn't even like know how the job selection process went i just went to meps which is like this sort of you know this this screening process you have to go through and they just like listed a bunch of jobs in front of me and i'm like reading the descriptions that didn't really like i didn't know what they meant and like oh i just picked the job that sounded cool and went with it and that was it man like you know i graduated high school i think it was like june and shipped out for basic training in august you know like eight weeks later and had to have my mom sign a permission slip essentially because I was 17, so I was underage. And, uh, you know, she was, you know, she was a little concerned, but I was like, you know, if I don't, if I like don't do this, like I'm gonna like run away or go do something else. Like I'm not just gonna like hang out at Red Bluff. I'm gonna find somewhere to go or somewhere to be. I can't stay here. Um, so yeah, I was the youngest guy in my military unit, um, 17 years old. And, yeah, it was just like in a in a hurry to just get out of there and start over. And in hindsight, it was probably the best decision I made um, because it did immediately get me out of that environment and you know give me new peers, a new environment, you know, new atmosphere, new goals. Just everything was completely different. Um, and you know, James Clear has you know he he talks about you know building good habits and 
how you need like a rigid structure and, you know, just sort of sticking to routines and all those kinds of things. And I, you know, I had that, I had that in, in the military, right? Like just everything was um, tightly regulated and predictable and by the book. And that was really helpful for me uh, at that young age. Yeah. You even talk about how being at Cambridge, you would row every day or when you were there because you could feel like I have the structure and the routine to, because you had grown up in such an unstable environment, having the routine was helpful to ground you in some way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, when I when I first got to so this was before the lockdown began. When I started my PhD, you know, twenty eighteen through early yeah twenty eighteen through early twenty twenty, I would row, and yeah, you had to be at the boathouse by I think five forty five a.m. And so you know, I'd, I'd wake up and you know to just know like okay, that's the routine. I'm going to be in bed by whatever ten p.m up at 5.30, row for two hours, be in the office by eight o'clock, you know, just like I know what the day is going to look like in advance. And to just have that structured routine built in, I, I need that. You know, I, I knew other PhD students um, who, you know, they, they, it was just like sort of second nature to them how to get shit done. You know, like maybe they'd roll out of bed after like a night at the pub, you know, they'd roll out of bed at 10.45 and, you know, kind of get the coffee and, you know, finally roll into the office at one. But like they knew how to like, OK, once they were focused, they knew how to like do it. Whereas for me, like if I start down that path, like, you know, suddenly nothing's going to get done because I don't have the structure and I don't have the predictability and the routine of like, you know, which hours are dedicated to which tasks. Um, and so now I have that. Um, but I think by now for me, it is to some extent second nature, but I still need that a sort of predictable routine of going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, which hours I'm working, which hours I'm reading, which hours I'm whatever, going to the gym. And yeah, I just have that um, sort of built in now. And it's very, it's very helpful. Yeah. One thing that really stuck out to me from reading the book was the, how, how often no one taught you how to do something. Yeah. And it's obvious when you think about it, when, if you were to think about it in hindsight, but it is clear how how much you can take for granted if you come from a two-parent household, just like your mom and dad t- saying, do this, do this. This is the way you eat. This is the way you do this. This is the way you read. this." And it's like, what was it like to constantly have to learn things yourself? Uh, I mean, I, it taught me to be sort of very self-sufficient and resourceful. Um, I mean, one thing that I, that I didn't have that I see like a lot of people doing now i mean not not even necessarily just kids from single parent homes or kids from environments where they didn't have a lot of oversight or mentorship but like you know p like immigrants right like they don't necessarily know how to like which offices to go for which things and so they just turn to google and i didn't really have that like google existed but not like it existed now this like the mid-2000s the internet was like a thing but not like it is now we didn't have smartphones Right. Like I had like some like cheap prepaid Motorola thing. I didn't get that till I think my sophomore year of high school. Um, And it was just like, you know, this pixelated little thing that, you know, you could text, you know, send whatever 10 cents to send a text message. And it was nothing like today where you could literally Google any question on the planet from wherever you are. Um, And so, yeah, it was like it was a weird thing where I would like ask. I would I guess maybe, you know, became more inquisitive. I would ask people questions or. I would um, look things up. I read a lot. I learned how to like go to the library and search like reference books. Um, later in the military, fortunately, you know, it, it, like there were just like older guys there who could just offer advice or like how to whatever, like lease a car or like how to whatever, like where like where the bl- best places to go to like find a, a place to rent or how to deal with whatever all of the, you know all of this whatever like the the people I don't know people still, still say the term adulting. But like how to be an adult, right? Like those kinds of things. And I didn't really have that. Um, So I kind of learned on my own. And it's weird now, man. Like when I, like I grew up my whole life without a father and none of my friends had fathers. I mean, one of them did, but he was like kind of an absentee dad. Um, But now like after entering college and after sort of entering this sort of more educated environment where basically all of my friends have dads. Uh, all of my college educated friends have dads and to like hear them reference it. Like dads are like that. Dads are like fonts of wisdom for a lot of people where like people will, will have to say, you know, like my dad always says that, or my dad tells me this, you know, more so than, than moms, you know, I don't know what that is. Maybe just because old men like to talk more or like, you know, dish out 
advice or wisdom more frequently. But, you know, my friends walked in, you know, cite something their dad says. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was only within the last couple of years that I realized, like, yeah, that's uh, that's something that I didn't really have. It was I never really felt the absence of it until I saw just how how big of a presence it was in other people's lives. Um, and so maybe to some extent it, it did sort of, yeah, lead me to be a little bit more resourceful and and become a more voracious consumer of information where I'll just read a lot or or you know, just try to learn as much as I can. Um, perhaps to some degree, just, you know, to be, to be prepared because I don't have the, you know, that, that, that sort of parenting structure or didn't grow up with it. How does it feel today to know that you do serve as a, a father figure for so many on the internet? Is that even true? Is that true? I don't think I, I serve as a I, father I, figure. I, I would say it's true to the extent that you dish out the wisdom that people wish that they receive from their father. Oh, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to answer that. I, uh, father, I don't know if I fill that role for people. I mean, that's weird to think about. I mean, I do take it. I, I mean, I do take what I write seriously. Uh, I try not to like mislead people or write like clickbaity bullshit or like try to push an agenda. I mean, I, you know, there are certain things that I, um, hold with strong conviction that I believe in, but I think most of my, I hope most of my beliefs are supported by evidence and so on. Um, and so I do take that role seriously and I try to be responsible with it. Um, cause I can, I see it, man. Like I see people who kind of came up around the same time as me, as far as like building an internet presence and a platform and everything where they are sort of leaning more and more towards that, what's that term audience capture or that, you know, like, I can see like the, you know, if they, if they write popular posts or whatever, like I can see the, um, like the evolution of the headlines that they write to the point where like, oh, they're just like optimizing for clicks now. Um, and you know, I get it like, you know, to some degree, you know, you have to do a bit of that just to break through all the noise, but I, everything that I write, I try to write from a place of truth, of honesty, of like, I'm not going to write something I don't believe in or just because it'll help make this thing go viral or whatever. Um, And yeah, I I guess, yeah, to some extent I do, you know, I I receive emails from people asking for advice or asking questions or thanking me for something that helped them. Um, A lot of students around Cambridge um, will email me, you know, I'm not even, you know, I don't, I have no affiliation with the university anymore, but they've heard about me or read something I wrote or saw a podcast I was on or whatever. And they'll, ask me to get coffee or whatever and ask for tips. And I guess in that sense, I feel like more like a big brother role rather than a father, but I guess it's the same in principle kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it feels like it feels immense because I don't want to like let people down and I don't want to mislead people even, even by accident. Um, so yeah, it's hard. It's hard, man. Like that, like as my audience grows and maybe, I don't know if you feel some of this too, of like, oh, like now if you tell people something that is potentially incorrect, like this may have like a material effect on people's lives. And I try to keep that in mind. That's beautiful that you, you think about that as you've continued to grow. And along those lines of, of being a father, what what in your view makes for a good father from the things that you have learned as well as the things that you have, the people you've seen for what you quote unquote didn't receive. Oh, wow. I mean, what makes for a good father, you know, asking, asking someone without a father, the question of what makes a good father. I mean, I mean, you know, I don't know if I'll be like the, the right, (laughs) the right source for that. It's almost like you have the, best perspective on that by virtue of the fact that you are coming in with the least amount of biases for what makes for a good father i mean you know it's towards the end of my book i i I write this line about how you know one goal i have is to be a better father than the fathers that i had or really didn't have And the bar is so low that I think even something like presence, you know, just like being there, I think is, I think for a lot of kids, even, you know, just, just having that, like, even if you disagree with your father or what, like, I think just having them around and like knowing that 
having that rock available to you. Um, yeah, of knowing that if you're in a if you're in a tight spot or if there's a serious emergency, like you know, you can call your dad, right? Like I I can see that, and I and I think yeah, aspiring to be that person, um, building that trust, and yeah, I think that's important. You know, winning the trust of your kids. I mean, this is something that I think a lot about. You know, because not only have had these personal experiences, but I've also you know, read a lot of the developmental psychology research and like, you know, a lot of what I do now with my work and with my job and everything is to like set myself up to be in a position where I can work from home so that when I do have kids, um, I can be around as much as possible. I know I'll have to, you know, have to travel sometimes or maybe do other things, but I'm going to try to, especially the first five to seven years, that's like a critical, you know, there's called like sort of critical, um, critical periods or sensitive periods. It's what they're referred to in the research. Of uh, those are the years when a kid really sort of learns to form attachments and develops a sense of themselves and how much they can trust others and how, um, you know, how to, I guess, learn to to be a social being. And so, you know, I want to be there. For, and I don't, I don't necessarily think all fathers have to do that. But for me, it would be something important to essentially like be there and be a predictable and reliable presence for the first few years of a kid's life. Um, it isn't to say like after that it doesn't matter but it does the first years are 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 the most important um and they're also like very fleeting too that's the other thing is like i think from like we have like weird uh sort of feeling of time based on our age uh i I once wrote this this joke tweet which is only like a hat you know tongue-in-cheek which was that you know by the time you're 30, you've already lived half your life, subjectively speaking, because time goes by so much faster the older you get. And so I wrote that while I was in the middle of writing my book, because, you know, when I was a kid, I remember like, like, you know, the, the period between starting school and, and Christmas break might as well have been an eternity, right? Like, you know, you start school in September and people are talking about December and you're like, that's like, that's so far away. Like, why would you even bring that up? Whereas now it's like, it's September. It's like, oh, like it's almost Christmas. <laughs> you know, like it's just a completely different attitude towards time. And so when you're a little kid, you know, the, once, once your memories and your sort of consciousness comes online around three or four, like, you know, every day, every week, every month, like 15 minutes, like if someone says like, oh, dinner, I'll be ready in 15 minutes. Like that's, that's an eternity. Um, and so 15 minutes with your dad, right? Like as a little kid, that feels like ages to spend 15 minutes with your dad. But when you're an adult, 15 minutes is nothing. So you can take that 15 minutes. And to you, it doesn't feel like much. But to the kid, that could mean everything. And so I think like that's important, too, is to just sort of understand from the kid's point of view what time feels like and how spending an hour or whatever with your kid for you, it may seem like, oh, that's an hour I could work or that's an hour I could do this or that. But in a way, you're paying an hour, but your child is receiving like 15 hours in terms of subjective experience of time. Uh, and so I think that's also something I'm going to, you know, try to keep in mind is just the time, the availability, the presence, the trust, all that stuff. It's such a good point because an hour to a five-year-old, it, the percentage of their life that they've lived and especially to their conscious memory is like, is a massive amount. And if we just don't, we don't realize that often. And, and it's such a good, helpful reframe. And I think this is also something that's helped me be more disciplined as I've gotten older it's because the time from September to December that you were talking about before, it's like, oh, that's not that much amount of time. So therefore, I could just easily do the things that I said I was going to do, whereas it was very difficult to do the same thing when I was 13, 14, 15. Um, I, I, on the, the point about fatherly advice, you wrote this great piece called 34 Lessons I Learned the Hard Way. And that was very much in the vein of things that you could imagine a father saying to a child. And that's how I read it at least. And I pulled out a few that I thought really stuck with me. And I was curious your perspective on them. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah, let's go. So number eight, I had to pull out because I did this for your book, which was read at least 10 pages of a book every morning. Funny. When did you instill this habit or bring it to the forefront of your mind? Yeah, when, um, hmm. I started doing it actually when I was stationed in Germany. Um, how old was I? I want to say I was maybe 21 or 22. 
um, I started to, by that point, I was making a little bit more money. I was, you know, I was, I was getting promoted and I was able to sort of afford. So I bought a bookshelf. I started to buy books and started this, um, I was sort of fill these shelves and, you know, I, I always enjoyed reading, but I, before that it was kind of unstructured where, you know, I'd read a book, a few pages here, a few pages there or whatever. And at a certain point I was like, you know, I, I actually want to read and I actually want to like you know, draw information out and be able to communicate and remember what I read and just do it in a more disciplined way. And so, you know, it was just kind of a self-taught or self-driven approach to reading where, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and drink coffee and read 10 pages and then go to work. Um, And that was just like a, you know, a way to sort of integrate that habit into a very busy life. I mean, I was, you know, it's just, I was working, you know, 12, sometimes 14 hours a day, or I'd work like the graveyard shift I'd work all night. And so, you know, it was just, you know, working, working 70 or 80 hours plus a week, but I still wanted to read and I still enjoyed reading and I wanted to be able to learn something. And by that point I was slowly gaining an awareness of my own curiosity and accepting it and recognizing that maybe at some point I would actually go to college and I would actually further my formal education. And, you know, I couldn't do it at that time because I was working and I had other obligations, but, um, reading books was like a way to just sort of, I guess, fill in some of the gaps or just sort of satisfy my curiosities. And so I, I, yeah, I've maintained that now for probably more than a decade now, 10, you know, 10 pages as a minimum. And it's grown and it sort of waxes and wanes. I mean, there are periods where, you know, I don't read at all because I have things to do or whatever, but I, that is like sort of default of just like carrying a book around or a Kindle or whatever, and just 10 pages a day, um, knock it out. And, you know, you can, with, with 10 pages a day, you know, that's a book a month. So, you know, just stick with it and you can get a lot of reading done. Yeah. It, it's really remarkable what 10 pages can do um, when it's compounded. I, I'm curious, what was... You know, we mentioned your childhood being so dark and there's so much darkness there. What were the first glimmers of light after after that that period of, of your life? Um, hmm. The glimmers. I mean, there were glimmers of light even when I was a kid. I mean, I guess like, you know, it's funny. Like as I was writing the book, especially like the first half, just covering, you know, age, what, zero to 17, essentially. I, I tried to like introduce a little bit of humor, a little bit of levity. Like I tried to like make sure it wasn't just completely relentlessly bleak, but even, even with those attempts, people still kind of come away like this is pretty heavy. And you know, I'm like, yeah, I, I guess it is. <laughs> like it's just that's that was it that, you know, these are this is just what happened. Um, but you know, throughout, there were adults that looked you know, attempted to look after me or give me good advice. I mean, teachers and, you know, my, my mom and Shelly for a while, you know, attempted to build a stable home for us and they were temporarily successful. Um, you know, my friends and I, at the time we had a lot of fun together. Um, not always in the safest or wisest ways, but you know, we did. Um, then like the glimmers of hope later, I mean, you know, one reason why I opened the book the way that I did um, with so chapter one, I opened with my graduation at Yale because I knew like this is about to, we're about to like dive into some pretty you know heavy shit. And so I want like the reader to know this is going to end up in a pretty good place. But we just got to like, you know, if you want to know the truth of what, the you know, because if I dived right in from the beginning of of, you know, being taken into foster care, I think it might have been too much for the readers. Um for a lot of readers anyway. Um, But like the real glimmers, you know, of course with my sister and the memories I have with her. And then as an adult later of, you know, once college started to sort of become a serious possibility, once it started to take shape in my mind and, um, you know, I think that too, six, you know, achieving some success in the military, early promotions and getting some awards and stuff. That was really cool. Um, realizing that I was capable of more than I thought. And then later when I realized, you know, I could actually go to college and I could actually do pretty well in my life. Um, 
you know, I, I, I tell this story, this guy at the boxing gym that I went to when I was a kid, he said, um, you know, you're going to do well no matter where you end up. And for some reason that had always stayed in my mind, it stays in my mind, you know, to this day, it's, it's been, you know, two decades now that, since he told me that. And once I started to realize that was actually true, um, yeah, like the, the confidence in myself, I guess, is what it was. Like that was really the, the true glimmer it was just like knowing that I had the inner resources to succeed. I just had to sort of accept what I wanted and go for it and stop letting whatever, you know, all of the, the bad memories and the bad experiences and all of the stuff that I could, you know, just to not let it hold me, hold me down or hold me back and to just go for what I wanted without um, reservation and without fear of failure or without um, yeah, judgment or, you know, the possibility of disappointing other people or myself. You know, I, I have this line early, I think, in the, in the preface about how if you're a kid and adults repeatedly let you down, then you learn to let yourself down. And so initially, that was my experience of just adults letting me down repeatedly. And then I started to make bad decisions later as a teenager and as a young adult. And once I got past both of those hurdles of, okay, adults letting me down, now letting myself down and engaging in these sort of self-defeating behaviors, once I can get past that, those two hurdles... Um, and accept what I wanted and go f and, 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 and strive for it, then, um, you know, I think that's like kind of, you know, one of the, in the books, you know, the kind of turning point, um, when I start applying to college and start really, um, going for what I wanted. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine how difficult that would be first to hear from everyone else that they've let you down and then to live in their perspective by letting yourself down and then overcoming that and how, how joyous it must feel to know that you are capable and you do have confidence. And what made the boxing coach say that? Uh, it was, so it was, it wasn't the coach. It was another, it was another student, but he was an older guy. He was older than the coach. Actually. He was like essentially a semi-retired high school guidance counselor. He would see me like, so I couldn't afford the classes, um, every month. And so I would stick around and like stay over and like help to mop up the floors or wipe down the equipment and just kind of hang out. And so he would stay, you know, he would see me doing this and, you know, he, I think he could just like, oh, here's a good kid who's helping out around the gym and, um, you know, he doesn't have any money, but he's just trying to, uh, you know, work his way to pay through, pay for these, uh, the, these, these, uh, lessons. And so he and I would talk and chit chat and whatever. And I mean, to be fair, he wasn't like entirely aware of like, you know, my other activities with my friends and like vandalizing buildings and, you know, drinking and all this other stuff that we were doing. But, you know, he just saw me in this like one context where I was like, you know, behaving pretty well. But, you know, just through talking with him and interacting with him and, you know, he was a, you know, a high school guidance counselor. So he had a pretty good sense of like, you know, speaking to teenagers who was, you know, capable of doing good things in their lives if they put their mind to it and, and maybe who, who would need a lot more help to do that. And so, um, yeah, I think he just saw, saw me in that environment, you know, and it's funny, like even, even after, I mean, the, the struggle never fully ends because even after going through, you know, the, the adults letting me down, me letting myself down. And then like, now I'm doing well in my life, but now I have to, what like like demonstrating to other people that i'm i i did actually rise above my circumstances and so on you know i was talking to uh to my girlfriend this was this was a couple of years ago before i'd met her parents and um you know to, and to their credit like they you know i i met them and they were great and they were you know they were wonderful but i remember i was nervous a couple of years ago before i'd met them and i asked my girlfriend you know like what like do they know how I grew up? Like, what do they know? And all this stuff. And, and she's like, no, no, but you know, we'll talk to them. And I mean, and I'm like, do you, how do you, like, how do you think they'll react? And she was very honest with me. And she said, they're probably going to be a little bit scared. Um, because if you think about it, like objectively, right? Like you, you know, your daughter brings home a guy and then you learn like, Oh, he grew up in foster homes and he used to do this, that or the other. And he was like, you know, he was in rehab and he was, you know, it's like, you know, like, okay, maybe he has accomplished some things later, but, you know, I think they're all, you know, it's, it's reasonable to be a little bit concerned that like, you know, who is this guy really? And is this like a sort of temporary blip 
of success, but ultimately, you know, will this, you know, how, how well will this end up? Is this like the best person that I could imagine my daughter being with and so on. And so even then, you know, but you know, they, they were accepting, I think, you know, there was, there was a little bit of concern in the beginning, but they got over it and we get along great, but you know, there's still that lingering feeling of like having to prove that, you know, I'm, I'm doing fine now and I'm not that the same person uh, that I used to be. And who would you be without that feeling? Uh, the feeling, um, wait, 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 sorry. The feeling, what do you mean? The feeling of insufficiency, inadequacy, or insecurity around how you grew up. I mean, if I didn't have that feeling, um, I mean, probably not much would change Nessus. Well, no, there is like that sort of compensatory thing of like, you know, I have to like show people that I am like a normal person. <laughs> and I think if maybe if I didn't have that feeling, I maybe wouldn't do that. Um, and I don't know, maybe that would change people's perception of me. And that's the sort of underlying concern is that, yeah, that people would, would see me in a different way if I wasn't, um, you know, making, trying to make it very clear um, that I'm you know, a pretty good person and whatever, you know. So I don't know. I don't actually know um, how how I would be received otherwise. Yeah. Could it be with more love? Could it be with more purity? Could it be with uh, a feeling of, oh, this guy is not only a great guy, this guy is, is comfortable in his skin and fully accepting of himself so we can greater accept him? Uh, I mean, maybe. Uh <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. I mean, like, comfortable in my... I mean, I feel like I am pretty comfortable in my skin. I mean, you know, I, I can interact with people and I can talk to people Absolutely. and it's fine. But, um, you know, to just... You know, like, it, we, we still live in a... Re like, even if I'm perfectly comfortable in my skin, we still live in a reality where people do sort of make... Uh, uh, you know, they will second guess people based on where they came from and so on. Like those things still exist in the world. And so even if I'm comfortable or don't even, even if it doesn't occur to me, you know, I, I get it. Like I, I understand like in certain contexts that people will, you know, like, like someone's daughter, right? Like they will have they, like in, in, in that situation, you're inevitably going to be scrutinized. It's almost like a job interview, Right. Where like if you go into a job interview and think I'm just going to be myself and like if, they, if my if this guy wants to hire me, he can. If, but you have to be a little bit mindful of how they're receiving you throughout the interview um, in order to get the job. Right. And so I think like in those contexts, you know, it's I don't know if it'll ever fully dissipate that feeling, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> of course, you have to be mindful, mindful of the context and also the more insecure you are around their perspective of you, the more likely they are to view you in a way that is not great yeah. to you. It's like, yeah. you know, yeah, I think the there case. is, yeah, there's a, I think, yeah, there's a, there, there is like a, a, a balance there. Like, I think it's, yeah, m mindfulness, but not let it sort of be overbearing or let it sort of rule every, you know, control everything you do, but to, yeah, be aware of it. And, um, yeah, and, then, and then to accept it, right? Like, you know, I think that because there's another way I could go into this, which is like, you know, I'm doing well in my life. And and if you're going to judge me, then fuck you for it, you know, because, you know, I love myself and I'm doing great. And, you Whoa, know, like that kind of thing. Well, that, that, that's going to the extreme. That's going to arrogance. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That's not the truest version of you. That's a that's a way to make yourself like it doesn't seem like you would ever do that. But that's what yeah, some people yeah. go to. As oh, a yeah, way yeah. I know people to, like this. Yeah. yeah. I know people who who have gone through a lot in their lives and they are doing well and they take on they adopt this I I don't know how 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 sincere it is but they adopt this persona of like you know like who are you to judge me because I've done so well and this kind of thing and like you know like I've climbed so and it's like but I but that's the I I understand that attitude too you know like I get like that kind of feeling of but you know I like I don't know, you know, but I, I think it's unreasonable because I think it's, it's people are people and they, you know, we're always sort of evaluating those around us to some extent. And so, you know, it's, uh, 
it's something, yeah. But but again, like for me, I don't think it's ever really been an issue. Like, no, you know, I don't think it's ever really held me back. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind too, which is like, yes, you know, people can be judgy and people can kind of like, you know, whatever, like make make uh, make their assessments of people. But on the other hand, like for me personally, at least, I've never, I don't think at least I've never had like a serious issue with my background holding me back. Um, and, I, and I think that reflects actually very well on people. Yeah, I, it reflects well on other people and also reflects how you show up yourself with not letting it hold you back or not right. being so insecure about it that it does hold you back. Because if you were so insecure about it, it would hold you back in some way. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Going back to the fatherly advice that was so wise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, number 11 is good conversations are made up of questions. Avoid speaking for longer than three minutes without asking one. And, and I will have to say, I went to dinner with you and I've never been so enthralled with a conversation because of how deep and wise the questions were. And so you actually live this and practice in normal everyday conversation, maybe not necessarily a podcast, whatever, but, and the, the, the stakes are different and the, the framing is different, but you actually lived this, and I experienced it, and it was a wonderful experience to eat dinner with you in Miami that that time that we did. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, that's uh, no, I, I I had a great uh, a great dinner with you that night. I mean, it was, yeah, yeah. It's so that 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 I mean, that was just through having a lot of conversations with a lot of different people in different environments, different uh, organizations. I mean, like, I, I guess like this is this is something that maybe I picked up just through living in so many different homes, so many different environments, just learning to get along with people and taking an interest in people, um, asking people questions, asking, you know, just sort of inquiring about what people's interests and hobbies and lives and opinions are. And, um, you know, and, and I would learn through speaking with other people who were good at that, um, other sort of curious and open-minded and just sort of social people and I remember just feeling good, you know, when people would ask me, what do you think about this? Or what are your thoughts? And I'm like, oh, that feels so nice because it didn't happen that often. Um, and so when it did, I took notice and realized like, oh, like that's a nice way to like make a connection with people and um, to make friends and to, you know, because I, I had to learn how to do that just through so many foster siblings, so many different kids, so many different homes and environments. And then later in the military, that was the other thing is like, in the military, I got stationed and deployed and sort of reassigned to different duty stations. And so, you know, you, I did have to sort of learn, you know, how to make friends and how to get along with different people in different units, different environment. And um, just over time, being observant, seeing other people who were good at being social and picking up those habits and lessons. And um, yeah, it's been and you can tell that like you could tell like if you have conversations with people who don't ask questions, <laughs> it's really painful. Um, and I've been in those situations and and it's it's painful. But if you ask questions, at least you can get through it. Right. But if no one's asking questions, there's no conversation. And then it just becomes this sort of awkwardness. Um, and so I can have conversations with people who don't ask questions because I'll ask questions. Uh, and in some ways it, it, it sort of backfires now and like where, you know, now I'm in a position where people kind of know who I am sometimes depending on where I am in the room that I'm in. And I don't always like, like in this context with a podcast, you know, I'm promoting a book, I'll talk about myself fine, but in day to day life, it's not my favorite thing in the world to do. And so I do like to learn about people and ask people questions about their lives. And I'm just a curious person. And so sometimes I've been in this situation where like someone kind of knows who I am and they want to talk to me and ask me questions and I'm asking them questions. And then at the end of it, they're like, wait, I didn't get to ask you anything. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, that's fine. You know, like, I don't know. I, I, it feels weird. Like in the personal context to like, you know, to be in that situation, I, I've learned to be in the question asking situation and uh, I, don't know, I just, I just enjoy learning about people. Yeah. It, it's such a beautiful attribute and it was so clearly on display when we had dinner and uh, I'm so grateful for that because it really is, it really is a gift. Um, another, another one that really stuck out was number 20, consciously exercise gratitude. For a shortcut to instantly improve your mood, envision plausible scenarios in which your life right now could be far worse than it is. What's that one all about? Yeah, I actually, um, I did like some version of this, not in an, like an organized way, but the way I would, uh, originally I would do it was just, you know, like if I was having a bad day or I was in a bad mood or something wasn't going according to plan, you know, I, I would basically just tell myself like your life 
overall is still better than it used to be. And then I would just think about the bad days that I used to have and like the kind of hopelessness too. I mean, you know, like I, I just, it's so nice to be an adult. Yeah. Like it, when you are in a situation where you're a kid and you don't have power and you can't make your own decisions and the people around you are like, maybe they have your best interests in mind, but they're not behaving uh, in the best way. It's like, it's really tough to like be subjugated in that way. Um, and so now like just the ability to make my own decisions to go where I want to speak to who I want to speak to and do whatever I want um, is just so nice. And so like, I try to like think about those things consciously. And then it became sort of more formalized later when I listened to um, like, I don't act like I, I listened to Sam Harris's podcast. I don't use his meditation app, but I did hear, I think I'm, I don't know if I would have been on like Instagram or something a few years ago. I saw this little clip of his, where he basically like lays out uh, in deliberate detail explicitly, you know, the steps for doing this. And he gives this example of himself, how he was like at dinner with his family and he wasn't having a good time. And then he immediately imagined like, what if his family had all died or what if, you know, everything had been taken from him, uh, that he would give everything he owned, everything to just return to this one moment of being bored at dinner with his family. Uh, and then that just totally reframed the way he thought about dinner that night. And, uh, and yeah, I try to do that too. Like if I'm, you know, having kind of a, you know, boring day or I'm stuck in traffic or whatever, it's like, you know, like if suddenly, you know, you lose everything or the person closest to you dies, like you would give anything to just be stuck in traffic again. Right. And so I think that's like an important, um, way to like, just sort of instantly reframe whatever, you know, uh, unpleasant situation you might be in. Yeah, it's a powerful realization. And if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're an hour, 10 minutes into it, your life is pretty good because you have the chance to listen to a podcast for an hour and 10 minutes. So it's a, it's a really remarkable uh, realization. And to always remember, like you could not be listening to a podcast. You could not be able or safe enough to listen to a podcast. You could be worried about your health, the roof over your head, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, important realization. Yeah. And the last one along those same lines is number 34. One of the most common life regrets people report is, I wish I had let myself be happier. You'll never be happy if you continue thinking that you'll be happy one day. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's something I'm still thinking about and struggling with to some extent because I think a lot of ambitious young people you know, they set these, um, like, you you implicitly make this pact with yourself. I think Naval has a line like this about whatever ambition is the pact you make with yourself to be unhappy until you succeed or something along those lines. And that's basically what it is, right? Like, even if it's not a conscious, like, thought that you have, the implicit belief is, like, once I reach whatever, like, once I reach the next promotion, once I make this much money, I reach this benchmark in my bank account or have this number of subscribers or followers or what have you, then like, then I, then I'll, then I can be happy. Right. Or like, that's the target. And I can't be happy until I meet that goal. And, um, yeah, I just think like, that's, you know, you, like that's never going to happen because as soon as you reach it, you'll be, you know, maybe you'll be happy for 10 minutes and then suddenly you're going to want the next, the next thing you're going to be itching for the next. And I don't know if we can ever, I think that's a very human thing. Um, but I do think that you know, you, you can, like, you can still have goals and still sort of enjoy the journey on the way to the goals, just day to day, um, be appreciative. And, you know, there are kind of, um, you know, the way that happiness researchers measure happiness, you know, this is somewhat simplified, but essentially the two ways that they do it, one is sometimes they call it happiness or they call it pleasure or positive affect or something, but so one question they'll ask, happiness researchers will ask people is, um, you know, basically, how happy did you feel today? Or how many times did you experience positive emotion today? Kind of a day-to-day -day thing. Um, and then they'll ask people uh, what's often termed life satisfaction, which is sort of stepping back and thinking about your life as a whole. How satisfied are you with it? And I think day-to-day, -day, most of us kind of live in that first way of thinking of like, today was a bad day because I was angry or because I didn't really experience as much joy as I wanted or whatever. You're just kind of like evaluating moment to moment, day to day, based on the sort of upticks and down 
you know, downward spins of your emotional emotion, the sort of ups and downs of the daily, you know, your daily life. But then, you know, I think most of us could probably be more mindful and happier if we did more of that sort of stepping back and comparing your life to where it was before or comparing it to like what the average life in the world looks like or what like plausibly what it could look like if if a few things have gone wrong so i think yeah just being a bit more sort of what like meta or just stepping back and thinking more about you know you can you can be happy now right like you can you can allow that and still not um you know it's not it's not going to cause you to to lose sight of your goals yeah dude you wrote a a memoir of your life and it's an incredible story and if it doesn't sell a million copies, I still love you. <laughs> and, <laughs> Thanks, and you man. can still love yourself and you can still yeah. be happy and you can yeah. still enjoy what is, you know? And yeah. even though I assume this will sell a million copies because it's so, it's compelling, it, it's okay if it doesn't. And yeah. it's truly fine and nothing changes if, it, if you don't achieve the amount of book sales or achieve amount of dollars in your bank account or followers. It's like, it's all good. And the card part is it's so insidious. You know, I wrote yeah. down in 2022, the Danny Miranda podcast gets over oh, a million yeah. downloads oh. a month by the end of next year. I wrote that down thousands of times. And it's <laughs> like, I didn't even realize that I was basing my happiness until after I achieved that. It was just something I picked up because I was like, I want to get this done. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's, it's important to be mindful of that. And yeah. I'm grateful for that last bullet point, number 34, because I think um, it's a message more and more of us need to hear and internalize more often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. I mean, it's, yeah, the book example is perfect, right? Because that is the thing right now sort of looming over me is like, you know, is this book going to do well? Is it going to sell as well or be received as well as I'd hoped? And I do distinctly remember when I started the project, um, you know, basically, the main the main ambition. Well, th I mean, there are two, but the the main one is that I'm happy with it, and that it's a it's a, it's it's honest, it's authentic, it's something that you know, even if no one ever read it, I'd be happy with it, um, and that yeah, that was the most important thing to me was to be able to to tell this story. And to get it all out and, and to just sort of overcome those internal difficulties and hurdles, the mental hurdles and and the fact that like, yeah, I still can't quite believe that I actually wrote the whole thing because they, I mean, it was like, it was so hard some days, man, of like trying to retrieve all of the old memories and then like put it together in a coherent narrative and to tell all of these stories and to um be honest about my response to these events and you know the, the the final chapter was more difficult to write than i expected um because it really is a sort of reflection on the book as a whole uh and all that i'd gone through in my life and kind of what my ambitions are for the book um but in the end yeah if it doesn't sell a million or it doesn't you know it doesn't do as well as you know my my wildest dreams um the fact that it exists, I think, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'll always be grateful that I, that I had the chance to, to do this. Yeah. It's a tremendous thing, putting your life down on paper. And I think more people should do it. And the fact that you've had such a, a whirlwind, ups and downs like no one's ever seen is, is a, a more, uh, more of a reason why you should be proud of what you've done. So thank you so thank much you, for writing it. Troubled by Rob Henderson available wherever you get your books amazon.com but maybe not new york city or san francisco book publishers but that's okay you can get them on amazon and uh, yeah we forgive them <laughs> we have full love and acceptance in our heart for them and and um you could follow this man on twitter he's got a twitter feed that my mom absolutely loves it's like her favorite account so god bless and anywhere else we should send people to connect with you further uh, you know, Twitter, the book, uh, Substack, robkhenderson.com. You can sign up for my Substack newsletter. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I think that's, that, that covers it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rob, for spending time here today. I'm really grateful for you. And 
I know you are inspiring so many people through what you do and how you show up in the world. So keep being you, my man. Thank you, Danny. This has been great.